Thank you, Jerome, and, and welcome. On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I'm your moderator tonight, uh, Zachary Davis, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you tonight's distinguished guest. Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer is the director of the Brookings Arms Control Initiative and is a senior fellow with the Center on the United States and Europe within the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. He currently focuses on arms control issues as well as matters pertaining to Russia, uh, Ukraine, and Europe. A retired Foreign Service officer with over 25 years of service in the United States State Department, he has focused on U.S. relations with the Soviet Union and Europe and all of the complex issues related to our relations with those countries and that region. He has served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs and as U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine from 1998 to 2000, a very interesting period in world history indeed. Uh, in addition to Ukraine, he served at the U.S. embassies in Warsaw, Moscow, and London, and was a member of the U.S. delegation to the negotiation on intermediate-range nuclear forces in Geneva. So, ladies and gentlemen, here to speak uh, about the opportunity to reduce nuclear arms and the... Uh, uh, ideas that are contained in his new book. Uh, please welcome Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador. Well, Dr. Davis, thank you for that very kind introduction, and thank you to the uh, World Affairs Council of Northern California for organizing this talk. Um, about uh, 15 months ago, Michael Hanlon, a colleague at Bookings, uh, we thought we would write this book looking at arms control opportunities. And since I'm in San Francisco, I should acknowledge the uh, Plowshares Fund based here. Their support made a lot of that work to that book possible. But as we were looking at the years 2013 to 2017, we thought there were a number of uh, prospects where arms control could make a significant contribution to U.S. security. Uh, and you, you don't do arms control for the sake of arms control. You do it because at the end of the day, it's a tool that makes American Americans safer and more secure. Uh, so we wrote this book. I'll talk about some of the ideas uh, this evening. And I'm going to break my talk down into three pieces. Uh, first, why arms control makes sense, why it's in the American interest. Second, what are some of the opportunities, some of the things that could be done in the next three or four years that would significantly enhance American security? And then third, what are some of the challenges that might hinder our ability to realize some of those opportunities? But let me start off first with just a presentation of briefly on where we are. Uh, in 2010, President Obama and then Russian President Dmitry Medvedev signed the new Strategic Arms Reductions Treaty, New START. That has three limits. Um, the treaty takes, entered into force in 2011, and these limits take full effect in 2018. And I'll try not to get too arms control wonky, but just to talk about what these limits are. The first limit is 700 deployed strategic delivery vehicles. That's basically missiles and bombers. Uh, and a deployed intercontinental ballistic missile is a missile in its silo. A deployed submarine-launched ballistic missile is a missile in a launch tube on a submarine. The deployed is important here because these are the missiles that could be launched literally within minutes. We care less about minutes that are missiles that are sitting somewhere in a storage bunker. The second limit, 800 deployed and non-deployed launchers and bombers, basically counts the missile tubes and the missile silos. And it allows the sites to have some empty silos or some empty missile tubes on submarines. And that's of interest particularly to the US Navy. And then the last limit, what I would argue is the most important, is 1,550 deployed strategic warheads. This counts not what goes up, but what comes down. And I've got to introduce you here to a little bit of arms control math in that 1550 doesn't equal 1550, it's more like about 1800. And that's because what 1550 counts is the deployed warheads on intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launched ballistic missiles. It counts them exactly. But when the negotiators were looking at bombers, they had a problem. And that was neither the American nor the Russian Air Forces ever keep weapons on bombers. 
The bombs and the cruise missiles are in a storage base somewhere at the air base. And so what they decided to do is each bomber would count as one deployed strategic warhead. Now that significantly undercounts what bombers can carry, but there's actually a logic here that goes back for 40 years of arms control. Uh, we've tended to worry more about ballistic missiles than bombers, and it really focuses on flight time. An intercontinental ballistic missile takes about 25 minutes to get to its target, a bomber's eight to 10 hours. So this does continue that, treat, uh, that history of more lenient treatment for bombers. So 1550, this is progress. Uh, start one, the, the first START treaty signed in 1991 when the Soviet Union uh, was still there, allowed each side up to 6,000 accountable strategic warheads. So we're making progress. And we're making progress in another way. Uh, this chart shows the US nuclear stockpile from 1945 up until 2012. And we're certainly way below where we were in the late 1960s where we had 33,000 nuclear weapons. And for the most of the Cold War, it was about 25,000. Uh, right now, the American total stockpile is down somewhere to between 4,500 and 5,000 weapons, of which a portion of that are deployed strategic weapons. So this is the starting point. And now let me give you four or five reasons why I would argue that further arms control is in the US interest. The first reason is uh, 1550, that's progress. But 20 years after the end of the Cold War and 20 years after the end of the Soviet Union, do you really need that number? Moreover, I don't think a lot of generals in the Pentagon lay awake wait late at night worrying about a Russian missile attack. But I would argue that as a general proposition, the fewer the number of strategic weapons that can strike the United States, the better off we are. And arms control can contribute to that goal. The second goal, or the second reason, is the New START Treaty only covers deployed strategic weapons. If we take a warhead off an intercontinental ballistic missile and put it in a storage bunker, for purposes of arms control, that weapon just disappeared. It's not limited. Uh, and in particular, the New START Treaty does not limit non-strategic, also called tactical weapons. And that's an area where the Russians have a significant advantage, at least four to one. And again, the arms control advantage here is arms control is a tool that may allow us to reduce that advantage in a way that it's hard to see the Russians reducing that advantage otherwise. A third reason is transparency. Arms control usually brings a lot of transparency information, and it helps the military avoid worst case assumptions, and it allows them to make smarter decisions about how they operate and equip their forces. But this shows an example here. Uh, under the New START Treaty, every six months, the United States and Russia exchange a huge amount of data. Now, they publicly publicize the three top numbers, the numbers in terms of the three main limits, the 700, 800, and 1,550 limits. Now, when you're talking about the limits on deployed strategic delivery vehicles or on deployed and non-deployed launchers, we actually have a pretty good idea how much the Russians have on our own. Well, through national technical means, that's a euphemism for things like spy satellites. Uh, and it, it's hard to hide a saddle, uh, to silo. It's hard to hide a submarine. But when you talk about deployed warheads, um, we don't yet have a satellite that can see through a silo door, through a nose cone, and count warheads. And New START lets us do that. And I'll give you an example. Under the treaty, 10 times a year, we can do what's called a type run inspection in Russia. An American inspection team goes to a Russian ICBM base, and within literally a couple of hours of their arrival, they're given a list that says, this is every deployed ICBM at that base. And it, it, that list also says the exact number of warheads on each individual missile. Now, they then have the right to choose one of those missiles and go and inspect it and say, you say there are three warheads here. We want to see three warheads when you open it up. But we then get to take that information back. And we've now done well over 20 of these inspections. So we've hit every Russian ICBM base, every Russian submarine uh, port. And we now have a very good idea of how many words they have, where they are. And that's something you know, arms control provided through transparency that we could not have gotten on our own. Another reason for pursuing arms control is cost savings. Uh, we're at a point where we have to make decisions in the next couple of years about what we're going to do to modernize the strategic triad, our land-based missiles, our bombers, and our submarine-launched ballistic missile force. And these things are not cheap. Uh, this picture here is of an Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine. The first one gets retired in 2029. So the Navy plans to start construction of a replacement around 2021. Right now, the Navy projects that the cost of the replacement submarine will be five to seven billion dollars for one boat. That does not count torpedoes, that does not count missiles. Now, these are incredibly complex pieces of machinery. Uh, they have to uh, operate in a very demanding environment. And the Navy is trying to figure out a way to reduce that cost. And I, I hope they succeed, but if you look at the history of naval shipbuilding over the last 30 years, the prices don't go down. 
Likewise, the Air Force would like to have a new bomber. Uh, the the B-52 here, it's a, been flying for 40 years. The B-52 will be flying for another 30 years. It has a drawback, though. It looks really big on a radar, and, and that's not good if you're a bomber pilot. So the Air Force would like to buy a new bomber. They're talking about $550 million a piece for the aircraft. So there's a lot of money here. And what I would argue, if you can do arms control and get the United States and Russia to come down together, you know, maybe we can buy, instead of 12 new submarines, eight or nine. Maybe we can buy fewer missiles and bombers. And that's savings either to reduce the budget deficit or to go to social needs or to go to military operations that are going to be far more likely than thermonuclear war. And then the last reason I would argue why the United States has an interest in pursuing arms control is for our credibility in terms of pushing back against nuclear proliferation. Even when the New START Treaty is fully implemented in 2018, the United States and Russia between them are going to still have 90 to 95 percent of the nuclear weapons in the world. And it's very difficult if the United States is not making an active effort to reduce its arsenal to go to China and say, you shouldn't build up, or to go to Iran and say, don't acquire a nuclear weapon. Now, I'm going to be a realist about North Korea and China. If the United States and Russia do another treaty tomorrow that significantly cuts their forces, that's not going to cause an overnight change in their attitudes. But what it will help is with third countries. And it will make it easier for the United States to encourage those countries to apply pressure on the nuclear pariahs like North Korea and Iran. And I would say, you know, if you go back to 2010, we signed the New START Treaty then. Uh, the Obama administration also put out a new nuclear posture, which reduced the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. strategy. And I don't think it's a coincidence that since 2010, we had greater success in our diplomatic efforts to persuade third countries to up the financial and economic sanctions on Iran. So I think our proliferation goals are served by our leading on arms reductions. So those are some reasons to go further. Let me now talk about what are some of the opportunities. And, and, and the first, I think the big opportunity is to further cut nuclear weapons. And when you think about this, there are a couple of questions. Question number one is, um, should we do it in a bilateral U.S.-Russia negotiation, or should we begin to broaden it to include other states? I'll come back to the multilateral piece in a moment, but I would argue that, again, with 90 to 95 percent of the nuclear weapons in the world, the United States and Russia have primary responsibility for leading in terms of further nuclear reduction. So a big piece of this should be one more bilateral U.S.-Russian negotiation. And again, what I'm talking about is the next step, which hopefully will be a series of steps that get us towards lower and lower levels. A second question would be is, do you want to limit just deployed strategic warheads, as the New START Treaty does, or is it time to expand that and capture other types of nuclear weapons? And, and this shows uh, basically uh, the total U.S. and Russian nuclear arsenals. Um, and I should caution you, when I, the deployed strategic numbers here are different from what you saw because these numbers here are not the numbers in, uh, according to New START counting rules. When we say 1950 American weapons, that's an estimate of how many bombs and cruise missiles would be used on the bombers, not just one warhead per aircraft. But what it also shows is that in addition to deployed strategic warheads, uh, there's non-strategic weapons also include called tactic weapons. The Russians have, according to the Federation of American Scientists, a 2,000 to 500 advantage. Those weapons are not constrained by any treaty. When you go to the next category, non-deployed or reserve strategic weapons, the U.S. military is very conservative on this and basically keeps one reserve strategic weapon for every deployed strategic weapon. And that's an area where the United States has a significant numerical advantage. And again, these weapons aren't counted. You know, if a warhead comes off of a missile and goes into storage, it disappeared for purposes of arms control. And so when you total up these stockpiles, the United States has an estimated 4,700 weapons. Russia's about 4,450. 4, now, these are unclassified numbers, so there's probably a little bit of plus or minus there, but I think the Federation of American Scientists is about as close as you can get in the unclassified world. Then there's one other category here, retired warheads. And these are warheads that both sides have said they're no longer in the active uh, stockpile. In many cases, they've been partially dismantled, but they haven't yet had their appointment with the guy with the screwdriver who takes them apart completely. And in some cases, on the American side, it's estimated that there's actually quite a backlog, several years, just in terms of our ability to disassemble the weapons. But probably those aren't nearly as much concern as the other weapons that are still in the active stockpile. So if we're looking at, I would argue it's now time to go beyond deployed strategic warheads and begin to address these other categories, non-strategic and non-deployed uh, uh, or reserve strategic weapons. It's time to basically get all weapons deployed, non-deployed, strategic, non-strategic, with the exception of that retired category, and you could deal with them in some other regime. Now, there are two approaches uh, to uh, looking at this. 
One would be, and this is what uh, my colleague uh, Michael Hanlager argued in the book was, what we called a big treaty, where the United States and Russia would sit down in a bilateral negotiation and put all the weapons on the table, with the exception of those retired category. And then you'd have a single limit that would cover everything. So your treaty would have one limit, and we suggested a total of 2,000 to 2,500 total weapons. And then there would be one subsidy of 1,000 deployed strategic warheads. So you would take that limit in the New START Treaty of 1550, you'd cut it down to 1,000. And the rationale for that sublimit is, again, these are the weapons that can be launched in some cases on three or four minutes notice. So those are the ones of most concern. When you're talking about tactical weapons or reserve strategic, in most cases, those are separated. They're not even on delivery systems. So they're in storage and they're lesser concern. Now, what that aggregate limit does is it forces a trade-off where the American side gives up or reduces its advantage in reserve strategic and the Russians reduce their advantage in tactical weapons. There's a trade off that, and I'll come back to that in a moment and show that how that works. And then uh, on the other limits, uh, just focusing on the limit of deployed missiles and bombers, you might take the 700 limit, bring it down to 500. That would allow, um, it would be about a 30% reduction, but it would allow each side, if it chose, to maintain a triad, a combination of land-based missiles, submarine-based missiles, and bombers, yeah. which both militaries, being conservative institutions, seem to be very comfortable with. Now, let's talk a little bit about how the trade-off works. And boy, these colors were a lot different from the chart that I sent out, but anyway. <laughs> um, the dark brown here, I mean, what this shows is three categories. Dark brown being deployed strategic warheads, uh, light green are non-strategic, and then the lime green are reserve strategic weapons. And that first column is the US today, the third column is Russia today. And what this shows is if you went into this limit of 2,000 total weapons, the Russians end up significantly cutting their advantage in tactical weapons, and the Americans significantly end up significantly cutting their advantage in reserve strategic weapons. That encapsulates the trade-off. And what this does is it brings each side down to about less than 50% of the weapons it has today, uh, but it still leaves each country with about six times as many weapons as the nearest third country, which would be France at about 300 nuclear weapons. So it would be a significant step. Uh, when Mike and I were thinking about this, we thought, could you go further and, and our sense was you probably could not go below these numbers in a strictly bilateral negotiation, that the Russians would say no, before going below, say, 1,000 deployed strategic warheads, you've got to bring China and the third countries in, in in some way, which would make the conversation far more difficult. Uh, so this is one way, and I think um, in, in talking to people in the administration in 2011, they were attracted to this idea of a big treaty. They liked the trade-off, they saw it as having the advantage of using the American advantage in reserve strategic weapons to reduce the Russian advantage in tactical weapons. Um, I think there's one problem, and the question is, would they have time to finish this before President Obama leaves office in 2017? Because this is gonna be a tough negotiation. It's gonna require addressing classes of weapons that have not been negotiated before. It's going to require verification methods that have not been worked out before. And I, I would guess that if you're looking at an arms control treaty, you want to have that ratification debate in the Senate in 2015, not in 2016 when things are heating up in election year. And so I'm not sure you can get this treaty done in time to do that. So I think in the administration they're thinking, are there perhaps other approaches that they could take that might allow them to have a, a concrete deliverable before uh, the president leaves office? And one approach, and this is not uh, speaking for the U.S. government, this actually came out of a track two dialogue that Brookings runs with uh, Madeleine Albright, the foreign sec former Secretary of State on the American side, and then uh, Igor Ivanov, a former Russian uh, foreign minister. And the idea that they're talking about this is maybe have two parallel tracks. One track where you deal with deployed strategic weapons as in noon start, and a second track where you take those other two categories, reserve strategic and non-strategic, also known as tactical weapons. And you, again, you want to keep those two categories together because that allows you to make that trade-off. And the first track on deployed strategic weapons actually could be quite fast. I mean, if the United States and Russia had a meeting of minds, you could just take the New START Treaty and agree to just change the numbers, take 1550 down to 1,000, 700 down to 500. You might stretch out a couple of the dates, but the beauty of it is the 500 pages of that treaty, which are agreed definitions, counting rules, and verification measures, they would work just as well for the lower numbers as they work for the current numbers. So this could be done in perhaps even two or three months. The second track is probably going to be more difficult because you would start out, uh, and again, what we discussed was sort of a phase, the first phase, transparency, beginning to exchange some data. 
A second phase might be confidence-building measures, agreeing, for example, that tactical weapons would be kept separate from their delivery systems. And ultimately, in maybe a third or fourth stage, getting to an actual negotiation aimed at numerical limits that would be parallel to what you had on deployed strategic weapons. But this track probably would take a, a lot more time. And the Russians, in particular, are a little bit hesitant to go down this. But that might be an alternate approach that would allow you to do something more in terms of strategic forces and at least set in motion a process that would deal with the rest. But either one of these approaches, I think you can argue, would in the next several years hold out the opportunity of an agreement that would significantly cut US and Russian weapons levels, but would still leave, I think, both sides with the deterrent that they would feel comfortably would uh, uh, guarantee their security and the security of their allies. So that's one opportunity. Uh, the second opportunity is a little bit deviation from arms control, but gets into the question of missile defense. And I, I, we, we address this in the book because the Russians have raised a lot of uh, issues that they say have to be addressed to get to nuclear reductions beyond New START, and the big one seems to be missile defense. And the basic Russian argument has been if missile defenses increase, they could upset that balance in strategic offensive forces. And the Russians are right at that point. Uh, but my argument with the Russians is that if you look at the number of strategic offensive weapons and the number of missile defense interceptors, the gap is so large that we don't have to be all that concerned about it at this point. Now, the big issue between Washington and Moscow and missile defense for the last couple of years focused on missile defense in Europe, where the United States had what was called a phased adaptive approach, the idea being, and the concern here was that Iran uh, could upgrade its ballistic missiles and have longer and longer range missiles. And over four phases, the United States would upgrade the capabilities of its standard missile SM-3 interceptor. Now in phase four, the interceptor was going to be given the capability to engage an intercontinental ballistic missile warhead. And the Russians basically said, hey, wait a minute. Iran does not have an ICBM, which is true. Uh, they said, we don't think Iran is going to have an ICBM for a long, long time. I, I think the Russians sometimes tend to underestimate those things. But then the Russian conclusion is, this uh, interceptor in phase four is not about Iran, it's about us. And, and for the last year and a half, there's been a fairly intense argument between the Pentagon and the Russian Ministry of Defense, complete with PowerPoints and view graphs, whether these things are a problem or not. But the point is, in, in March, that argument became moot because the Defense Department announced it was canceling phase four. Uh, because they couldn't get it to work, uh, and, and the cost was going to be prohibitive. Uh, so phase four, that cancellation, may create an opening for the United States and Russia to put the missile defense differences behind them and go back to an idea that was raised in 2010 as a result of a conversation of NATO leaders and then Russian President Medvedev. And the idea was for a cooperative NATO-Russia missile defense, the idea that they would work together to defend Europe against ballistic missile attack from any uh, direction. Uh, and in 2011, in the first part of that, there were some fairly intense conversations between the Pentagon and the Russian Ministry of Defense where they begin to think about if we actually had a cooperative NATO-Russia defense system, what would it look like? And they agreed on several key points. You know, one was there has to be transparency. If you're going to be working with the other guy's missile defense, you have to have some understanding of the numbers and the capabilities and such, and sides agreed on that. They also agreed that joint exercises would make sense. Uh, because that's a way for NATO and Russian military officers to work together and then understand how the other guy works on these problems. And that's also not too difficult. I mean, we've been doing actually joint missile defense exercises with the Russians going back to the late 1990s. The third point they agreed, though, is that it would not be one system. It would be two separate systems, a NATO system and a Russian system working together. And the reason they couldn't have one system is Russia didn't want to work for NATO and NATO doesn't want to work for Russia. But the idea was two independent systems with NATO deciding to launch a NATO interceptor in, if the need came up, and Russia deciding whether to launch a Russian interceptor. But they said there are a couple ways that they could interact, and they came up with the idea of two centers, uh, two missile defense centers. Now, they could have got, agreed on one. I think they agreed on two so that one could be in Russia and one could be in NATO territory, and that's the way these things are done. But one idea was a data fusion center. And the idea here is that you take early warning and tracking information from American satellites and NATO sensors and from the Russian counterparts, you bring it to a jointly manned NATO-Russia center, you combine it, and then you send the enhanced product back to each side. And that gives us the benefit, for example, I mean, this would be of interest to the United States, the radar, uh, the ground-based radar that has the best view of Iran happens to be Russian. Uh, so if we get access to that data, that would be useful. I think the Russians would like access to some of the satellite uh, data that we have. So there's an opportunity here 
in a way that would make the side smarter about the missile defense environment around their borders, or around the borders of Europe. They also talked about a planning and operations center, and this is where you would bring NATO and Russian military personnel together, and they would discuss things like, what threats do you worry about? What's the attack scenario that you're prepared to deal with? What are your rules of engagement? So again, you have some better understanding about how the other side would operate so that the systems, in fact, can function in a parallel way. And, and what I think is with the cancellation of phase four, there's a possibility here that the Russians would have to back off of a demand for a treaty, which is hard to do, and I can talk about that more in, in the question and answer period. But if the Russians back off that demand, you can take these pieces and put them together, I think, fairly quickly in a way that would do two things. One, it would remove missile defense as an obstacle for further uh, reductions of nuclear weapons. But second, it would allow a cooperative NATO-Russia missile defense system. And I've had conversations with former Russian generals who basically said, if you get a NATO-Russia system on missile defense like this, uh, basically, we're allies. And they said that has a very positive impact then on how Russians begin to think about NATO. So there's an opportunity to do something in the missile defense field, maybe in the next one to two years. A third opportunity I'd raise would be, and this is a long shot, is ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, the treaty was signed uh, back by the United States back in 1996. Uh, it would ban all tests underground as well as anywhere else. Uh, in 1999, the U.S. Senate considered it and did not consent to ratify. Uh, uh, in 1999, the Senate had two big questions. They said, if we ban nuclear testing forever, how are we in the United States going to be sure that our weapons remain re reliable? And second, how do we know the other guys won't cheat? And th those were two good questions. Um, since then, there's been a moratorium in effect. Uh, the only country that's tested since 1998 has been North Korea. But there still is a feeling in the international arms control community that if you could bring the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty into force, and a U.S. ratification would be a big step, would probably prompt the Chinese to consider ratification, uh, that, that raises the legal barrier to nuclear testing. And when you look at the two questions the Senate asked back in 1999, Today, they're actually much better answers. So the Department of Energy has put a lot of money into the stockpile stewardship program, which has been designed to say, how can we be sure that the weapons will remain reliable without nuclear testing? And in fact, some of the labs have said, we've actually learned thing more things about weapons, or we've learned things about nuclear weapons that we never learned from 45 years of testing. And so for the last several years, the lab directors and the commander of strategic command have all certified that the arsenal is reliable. And I think we're about at the point where people are pretty confident the weapons will work, and we can assure ourselves of that without actually having to take one out, put it 2,000 feet underground, and setting it off. On the verification point, again, American national technical means of detecting tests have become better, but they're also supplemented by an international system. Uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty set up a system that ultimately will have about 335 sensors around the world. And this includes sensors under the ocean, hydrophones, which would hear an underwater nuclear test, it includes air sniffers. Uh, if you do even an underground test, it's pretty likely that radionuclides will sleep out in the atmosphere. The air sniffers would detect that. And then it depends a lot on seismic detectors. And the seismology is getting pretty good. Uh, we're now down to the point where the international system probably, could, well, actually, I think almost certainly could detect a test anywhere in the world of one kiloton. Um, by point of comparison, the weapon that was used on Hiroshima was 15 to 20 kilotons. Moreover, and this is where we're fortunate, the geology in places like North Korea, China, and where the former Soviet nuclear test sites are is such that we could probably, with seismic means, detect a test down to 0.2 kilotons. So we're getting to the point now where the sorts of tests that might escape detection really aren't significant in military terms. So the questions the Senate had, uh, former Secretary of State of George Shultz, the way he puts it is, the Senate, you know, you guys were right to vote no in 1999, but you'd be right to vote yes in 2013. I'll give two other reasons why I think it makes sense to uh, ratify the treaty. Um, one is uh, I spent a week uh, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in October and asked about the possibility of resumption of nuclear testing, and they looked at me like I'd stepped off of a spaceship, which in Las Vegas is, you know, you have to go pretty far to get that kind of reaction. Uh, and, and the reaction were two. They said, remember how hard we fought in Nevada against storage of nuclear waste? at the test site. Do you really think anyone's going to be enthusiastic about resuming testing there? And then somebody pointed out the population of Las Vegas is about triple of what it was in 1992, which is when we did the last test. So 
I, I question the political practicality. I mean, if, if people say we shouldn't ratify because we want to preserve the, te the right to test, you have to ask, is that even feasible? I think politically it's not in Nevada. And I don't think there are a lot of other states that would welcome the opportunity to host a nuclear test site. The fourth reason uh, gets back to uh, U.S. security. This shows uh, the number of nuclear explosions conducted. The United States has conducted since 1945 1,054, and that's more than the rest of the world combined at 1,029. But not only did we do more tests, we learned more from individual tests than others did. And I'll give you one example. Um, back in 1988, I was uh, the arms control officer at the American Embassy in Moscow, and we and the Soviets had agreed to do what was called the joint verification experiment. And the idea was that the Soviets would have monitors, people present at the Nevada test site when we did a test, in order to measure the size of that test. And we would have people at Semipolitans, the Soviet test site, to measure the size of their test. And so about six months before these tests happened, uh, I was the liaison officer, and I took a group of about 20 people from the Department of Energy, Los Alamos, and the Nevada test site, and we went out and spent several days at Semipolitans talking to the Soviets about how we would make this experiment work. And one day they took us out in the middle of the test site and they said, this is a hole, this is a vertical shaft that we've drilled for an upcoming test. And it was about three feet in diameter and it went down about 2,000 feet. At least that, that's what they told us. And when we looked down, it looked like it probably went down 2,000 feet. But as we're looking down the hole, one of the guys from Nevada says, boy, the Soviets are going to be really surprised when they get to Nevada. And I said, why? And he said, well, when we drill vertical shafts for nuclear tests, we typically drill them 8, 10, and 12 feet in diameter. And I said, why would you do that? Because modern American nuclear weapons are pretty compact. You don't need that. And he says, it's not about the size of the weapon. It's about the size of the area that you have in the shaft above the weapon to put more instruments. So not only did we do more tests, but we had more instruments collecting data. And so my argument for the test ban treaty is, you know, we're smarter than anybody else about nuclear weapons and nuclear explosions. Why would we not want to freeze that advantage and prevent the rest of the world from catching up? But as I said, I think this is a long shot. Uh, the Obama administration, I think, would like to try to bring this to the Senate, but they did need to do a very careful head count because what they don't want to do is have the treaty go up again and fail. That would be bad politically, but it would be a disaster for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. But there is an opportunity here, even though it's a long shot. Okay, last opportunity is, is on the multilateral side. And this basically shows what third countries have. Uh, France has, has about 300 weapons, it's, it's the third largest, and then others have, well, Britain above 200, China about 250 and such going on down. Now, the nuclear reductions process, while well, I would argue the United States and Russia have the primary responsibility to lead on this, it can't remain a U.S. and Russia process forever. And at some point you'll have to bring in these countries. And, and what I would argue that perhaps you want to start with Britain, France, and China, they're members of the U.N. Security Council, along with the United States and Russia. And, and maybe not bring them into a negotiation, but get them to begin to so show some transparency on their forces, disclose some numbers, and then perhaps take a unilateral commitment, a political commitment, not a treaty commitment, a political commitment not to increase as long as the United States are and Russia are reducing. And that avoids this kind of contradiction where the United States and Russia are coming down and China is going up. And it creates, I think, conditions where it would be easier to persuade the Russians to reduce. So this is, these are baby steps in terms of the multilateralization of the process, but it begins to move towards bringing some of these other countries in. So th those are the opportunities that Mike and I saw you know, to reduce U.S. and Russian arsenals significantly, to resolve the impasse on missile defense, perhaps to bring the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty closer to entry into force, and maybe to begin expanding the arms reductions process to third countries. Let me talk just a moment about some of the challenges, and I'll list three. The first challenge, and I think this is the biggest challenge, is do the Russians want to play? You know, what does Vladimir Putin want to do? And if you look at what the Russians have been saying in the last year and a half to two years, they don't express a lot of enthusiasm for further nuclear reductions. Uh, now, part of this, I think, is Russian posturing. The, as one of my uh, colleagues uh, from the uh, government used to say, the Russians say no, 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 until they say yes. But, it, but it's a posturing. But I think there are also a couple of incentives the Russians do have to negotiate with us. And this, this goes back to the data exchange in March of 2013. And, and the point here basically is that the U.S. military is very well set up to stay at 700 deployed strategic delivery vehicles and 1,550 deployed strategic warheads. We don't have to build another missile or submarine or bomber to do that for the next 15 years. The Russians aren't. In fact, the Russians are already way below the limit on deployed strategic delivery vehicles. They're below 500. 
and they're already now below the warhead limit. And they're having to make investments, significant investments, in new submarines, in new missiles. And the question for them is, do they want to make a lot of investment to come back up to 1550, or maybe there's an opportunity for them to save some money by bringing some of these numbers down? So I think that's one incentive, particularly if the Russian economy uh, continues to underperform, and the numbers in the last year or so suggest it's going to have trouble meeting the growth rates of the previous decade. A second uh, point gets back to one of these numbers I talked about, reserve strategic warheads, where the United States has a significant advantage. And, and not only is the United States with about 2,200 reserve strategic warheads, maybe 700 for the Russian side, but because of the way the side's reducing, this is a much more meaningful number for the United States. As the Russians reduce their missiles, the missiles that they keep in the force have full warhead sets. What the United States is doing is a process called downloading, and that is we're taking missiles off, or, I'm sorry, warheads off of missiles so that we have missiles with less than their full warhead sets. So the Trident submarine launched ballistic missile can carry eight warheads. Under New START, the average Trident missile will carry about four, maybe four and a half. Now, it'll have those spaces where you could add warheads, and those extra warheads are going into storage. And because of the backlog, they're not going to meet their date with the guy with the screwdrivers for 10 or 15 years. And that gives the Americans the option, should there be a crisis or the treaty break down, to add probably about 1,000 warheads above the, above the 1550 level. And the Russians from the foreseeable future don't have that capability, and that bothers some in the Russian military. I mean, had I been a member of the Russian Duma, the Russian parliament, and had it not been a rubber stamp uh, body, uh, this would have been the biggest question I would have raised about the New START Treaty from the Russian perspective. So there may be some incentives that the Russians have uh, to actually engage on some further reductions. A second challenge is verification. Uh, this is a picture I found on the internet. That, uh, this purports to be uh, US B-61s. Those are nuclear gravity bombs in a storage bunker somewhere. And the challenge here is verification. Uh, under the New START Treaty, we're pretty confident we can monitor the numbers under New START because when you're talking about deployed warheads, they're on missiles, they're on missiles on, on submarines, and, and those are pretty easy to find. But if you start talking about monitoring warheads that are either reserve strategic or tactical, you're talking about weapons that are not associated with delivery systems that are sitting in storage bunkers. Now, this is not an insoluble problem but it's going to get way beyond the comfort level of both the American and Russian militaries. And they're going to have to think through some different verification techniques and, and do some things that in the past they've been very unwilling to do. Uh, if they were going to have a verification regime that could support limits on tactical and reserve weapons. And then the final challenge I think that's out there is the U.S. Senate. Uh, it's pretty clear that Republicans in general are much more skeptical about arms control than Democrats or President Obama. Uh, the example I would give is the New START Treaty. Uh, people at the uh, at beginning of 2010 in the administration thought that New START would be ratified with 90 votes. Uh, in the end, it took them six months, a lot of promises, a lot of arm twisting, and they got 71 votes. Uh, I think that the process unfortunately became politicized, but there is that question, if they did a treaty, would it have a reasonable chance of being ratified? And I think that's a, a, an open question, and, and one of the things that the administration may be thinking about now is, are there mechanisms short of a treaty that would require Senate ratification that could achieve some of these reductions? And, and there may be some options out there. So let me just close by saying I think there's a pretty ambitious out, uh, agenda out there in terms of opportunities. There's also some pretty daunting uh, challenges that have to be overcome. And, you know, but if we could, we could do some things in the next three or four years that I would argue would leave the United States significantly better off in a much more secure position in terms of the nuclear world. So it's certainly worth pursuing. And in terms of, you know, looking forward to say whether we can do that, I, I'd point at two things. Uh, Presidents Obama and Putin are going to meet in June in Northern Ireland. But more importantly, they'll have a full-up summit in September. And I think that September meeting will be the signpost. Uh, that's going to be the point where we see, are they prepared to move forward in a way that would allow us to take advantage of some of these opportunities, or are we going to be stuck where we are today? So at that point, I hope I haven't been too arms control wonkish, but I'd be happy to take whatever questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for those remarks. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at the book, uh, I, I would urge, if you have any interest in these topics, it is a tour de force. It is the one thing you need to get on top of, of these issues as they uh, uh, really uh, come to the fore. And, and as we've heard, 
these, these issues are, are, are hot and heavy right now for us. We've got some excellent and thoughtful questions for you. Uh, and the first one is, is, a, is, is really definitional, uh, and, and, and it goes to, to the heart of really the, the, the subject of nuclear weapons. And, and uh, the question is really, you know, what is a tactical yeah. nuclear weapon? And that goes to the question of, you know, is there such thing as a tactical use, and can you use a nuclear weapon and not have a strategic yeah. impact? Or, uh, you know, w w what defines that in yeah. the current context? Yeah. And that's a really good question, and it's a really hard question. And if you asked Americans, Europeans, and Russians, you would not get anything like the similar answer. Uh, Mike and I sort of took the, uh, the cop-out way out. We basically use the term non-strategic and define that as anything that's not limited by the New START Treaty. So if it's not an ICBM warhead or an SLBM warhead or a bomb or a cruise missile for a strategic bomber, it counts. So that grabs all the tactical bombs, tactical missiles. It grabs air defense missiles. Because, and we did it that way because it's hard to come up with a real definition that everybody can agree to. Uh, I was actually at a, a track 1.5, a combination of government experts and non-government experts workshop in, in Warsaw in February. A and the definitional question, we went around this for an hour or two, and finally people said non-strategic works because it includes everything. And if you say strategic and non-strategic, then you've covered the full spectrum. And you don't have to get into complicated definitions of range or yield or things like that. Uh, I, I mean, I guess my own view is I, I think the distinction should be blurred. Uh, and I would argue that if a, tactical, if a nuclear weapon goes off anywhere near you, it's going to seem awfully strategic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then similarly, one of the you know, core questions that, that, that comes from the audience is really you know, how much is enough, yeah. right? Why, yeah. why are these levels that can be negotiated sure. uh, the appropriate objective? Yeah. And uh, the second question, relatedly, really cuts to the core of this question, is, that, well, why do we even have them yeah. uh, anymore? You know, what is deterrence and what yeah. is mutually assured mm -hmm. destruction in the current context? Uh, does it make any sense yeah. or do they still fulfill uh, an important role? Okay. Now, I, again, really good questions. Um, I mean, these are what I was talking about sort of next steps, what might happen in the next three or four years. If you're looking longer, I mean, I say, I'm actually a member of Global Zero, advocate the goal of a world without nuclear weapons. Having said that, I don't know if we can get there. Uh, I think there are a lot of hard questions. You've got to deal with a lot of problems that give rise to countries wanting nuclear weapons. Uh, and I, I, I look at this from, a again, a parochial American viewpoint. You know, if I had a button here that I could push that would verifiably get rid of all nuclear weapons, from the point of view of the United States, that's actually a pretty good world. I mean, we have friendly neighbors in Canada and Mexico. We have the protection afforded by the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and we have the world's most powerful conventional forces manned by the most professional military ever seen. Uh, that, that's a pretty good world. Now, if I'm Russia, and, and my neighbor is not Canada, but it's China, with a population 10 times the size, with a much more modern conventional forces, I think there's a different approach to a world without nuclear weapons. But I would still argue that you set that as the goal, and you work in that direction. And, and if you are smart, you can de design steps where even if you never reach the goal, you can at least improve on the current situation. The, the question on how much of enough is, and again, the numbers that we looked at here seem large, although, again, we're talking about a reduction that would be more than 50% in the US-Russian arsenals. Um, we were looking at it in a, in a bilateral context. And part of that was, I think, because of Russian concerns. Uh, it, it's hard to, it would be hard to persuade the Russians to go below these numbers in the next step without bringing third countries in. And our view was that doing one more bilateral negotiation was worth trying, because once you bring in other countries, it's going to become a much more complex negotiating process. So instead of needing three or four years, it could stretch out for a very long time. So we thought one more US-Russia negotiation, and then at that point, then you bring in other countries, and you press to see where you can go. Well, can I press you a little bit yep. on that point? Uh, so if we imagine uh, a world without nuclear weapons, uh, do, do we assume that, that that would be a better world? I mean, it's true that as the yep. preponderant military power of the United yep. States would have certain advantages, mm -hmm. but it also might be faced with a continued violence of, yep. of, of various natures yep. throughout the unstable regions, and it's not clear necessarily. So getting to back to that question of, 
And do they stir, still serve a, a, yeah. a purpose in, in, you know, the, the, the term we use is, is stability yeah. or strategic stability, but that's one of those onions when you start to peel away, it's, it's a little more complex yeah, than that. No, so. no, it's, it's, a, it's a complex issue. The best argument that I've heard against my advocacy of Global Zero uh, was made on a panel discussion uh, two weeks ago by somebody who does not like the idea of Global Zero, but his point is, and he's right, if you look at World War II, nuclear weapons killed 200,000 people. Conventional bombs, tanks, artillery, bayonets killed 50 million. And so the question he says, and this is a legitimate point, if you get rid of nuclear weapons, do you remove that horror of nuclear warfare in a way that creates the possibility of renewed conventional conflict? Uh, and, and I'll give two answers to that. The, the, my answer to that first part is, again, if, if a world gets to the point where it would ever consider redu eliminating nuclear weapons, just by the nature, you're going to have some resolution of the tensions, for example, between China and Taiwan, mm. between the Arabs and the Israelis, that leads states to acquire nuclear weapons. Now, that's kind of a... That's a cop-out point, you know, it, it, it's assuming <laughs> that happens. But the second point, though, where I, I, I think those more serious is uh, I, I think the risks of a nuclear world are growing. Uh, I, I'm a fan of nuclear deterrence. I think nuclear deterrence successfully kept the peace between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War when in other historical circumstances, when you had two countries that were so opposed in ideological, political, and military terms, they might well have gone into direct conflict. So nuclear deterrence worked in that sense. But I'd put an asterisk there, and that is there are several points where we got really, really lucky. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 when the Soviets put missiles into Cuba, um, the advice given by the Joint Chiefs of Staff and most of the civilian advisors to President Kennedy was basically airstrikes. And these were not, I mean, the first wave was going to be a thousand airstrikes. So in that first wave, a lot of Soviets and Cubans were going to die. And then followed up four to six days later by an invasion of the island. Now, the president chose another option. He instead chose to impose a naval blockade on Cuba, which created time to work out a diplomatic solution. Uh, what President Kennedy didn't know, and what we've heard since then in, in the 1990s, was that the commander of Soviet forces on the island had already been given release authority for <laughs> use of tactical nuclear weapons. So he didn't have to call Moscow. If the Marines came ashore, he had the authority to use weapons. And that had four uh, tactical uh, weapons pointed at Guantanamo, which at that time was not so much a detention center, but it was a very large American naval base. Uh, there's another story that came out from Russians a couple of years ago that as part of this blockade, one of the tactics of the U.S. Navy was to harass Soviet submarines drop not small depth charges basically to make noise, but to force them to surface. And there was one Soviet submarine that was being worked by three U.S. destroyers, and the captain basically said, I think it's time for us to, to attack. And according to a crewman, basically wanted to use a nuclear-tipped torpedo. Uh, now, uh, what the crewman said was that under the procedures, the captain had to have the votes of X number of the officers to do that, and he had X minus one which was good. But again, you know, what would have happened had that, had that one vote gone the other way, had the Soviet submarine uh, attacked three American destroyers with a nuclear weapon? I, th I think we got lucky. There are also, um, both on the American and the Soviet side's cases where computers uh, made mistakes, computer ships failed. Uh, in 1979, for eight minutes, the North American Air Defense Center thought that there were 250 Soviet ICBMs flying towards the United States. Uh, now, in that time, things, I mean, people are beginning to wake up people. Um, I think uh, Bill Perry, the former Secretary of Defense at the time, he said he actually got called and got on the alert process. And things were happening around the country. I mean, B-52s with nuclear weapons on board, their engines were splinted, they were getting ready to launch. And then somebody said, no, wait, it's a, it's a faulty computer chip. Okay. So, so my concern here is we've been lucky in the past. Uh, I'm not sure I'm prepared to bet that we're always going to be lucky in the future, uh, particularly when you have countries, more countries with nuclear weapons, and some of those countries are places like Pakistan and North Korea. So I, I worry that the use of a nuclear, I, I think we've made progress in that the kind of cataclysmic nuclear exchange that you know, we all did duck and cover uh, to uh, avoid back in the 50s and the 60s. I think that's near zero. But, but I think, uh, oddly, that the prospects of the use of a nuclear weapon in the next 10 years are probably greater than they were during the Cold War. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's a question of risk. Yes, there's a risk going to a non-nuclear world, but there's also a lot of risk with staying where we are now. Right. Uh, 
following up on that, one of the questions from the group is, is uh, have there been recent instances where there were mistakes or mishaps that uh, maybe yeah. reinforce that, that lesson that uh, things sometimes don't work out as planned and Murphy's Law follows us uh, even into the nuclear yeah. world? Yeah, the, the last one I heard of was back in, I think it was 1993 or 1994. And again, this is shows how complex systems sometimes break down. Uh, the Norwegians, uh, was, I think it was a joint Norwegian-American product, it, it launched a sounding rocket in northern Norway. Uh, and this had actually been notified to the Russians. That, but the word had not been passed to the Russian uh, general staff and the people looking at their radar screens, and all of a sudden they see this missile coming out. And the original interpretation by the military was, this is a decapitating strike, it's a, it's a one-shot aimed at Moscow to paralyze Russia, then there would be a follow-up strike. And finally, somebody said, you know, this just, it makes no sense. But again, there was misinterpretation there. Uh, so I, I think, uh, again, systems break down. And I think with nuclear weapons, and I, I, I want to give both sides credit. I mean, both sides put in a lot of safeguards uh, so that if the system fails, it, it usually fails on the safe side. But there have been a couple of instances where the system came very close to a failure that would have been, you know, catastrophic for, for us and the Russians and the several billion other people. So, moving to the other nuclear weapons states, uh, the uh, question comes up from, from the group, uh, what about China? Yep. And where are they now? Mm -hmm. And where are they going in terms of trying to deter the United States yeah. or Russia or other countries, and, and, and what are their objectives with respect to sure. their nuclear arsenals? And then, of course, relatedly is, you know, would they be interested in getting involved in, in a discussion such as the one that you've yeah. described, or is there some way to entice or some way draw them into a discussion mm -hmm. of, 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 a, of a drawdown? Yeah, okay. Well, I think... Um, China, I mean, has engaged on a fairly significant military buildup over the last 20 years as the Chinese economy has grown. Uh, but they've been, I think, more modest in terms of their nuclear capabilities. So they have, it's believed, between, say, 240 and 300 nuclear weapons, of which about 50 to 60 are on intercontinental ballistic missiles that could reach the United States. And although they seem to be modernizing, they don't seem to be embarked on a major expansion. And part of that is, I mean, China has an interesting nuclear doctrine, which is very different from that of the United States or, or Russia. Their doctrine, they, they emphasize no first use. Uh, but they also uh, have what we would describe as a minimal nuclear deterrent. I mean, I think the Chinese view, to put it in very crude terms, is the Chinese believe if they can put a nuclear warhead on, say, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Denver, and Las Vegas, that's going to deter an American president from doing most things that they would want to use nuclear weapons to deter him from doing. And I think they're probably right in that calculation. Uh, so one of the things I think that, you know, it's good is that the Chinese have been modest. There are, I should say, there are some analysts in Washington, I don't agree with this, but they're cons they, they say that they believe that if the United States and Russia come down to a certain point, China may then say, well, at relatively low cost, they could sprint to be the third nuclear superpower. That doesn't seem to be consistent with what we've seen the Chinese do in nuclear weapons over the last 30 years. So the question is, can we sort of find a way to engage them? And I mean, they're not going to endorse the idea right away of reductions by them. I think if you ask the Chinese, we want you to reduce, they'll say, well, when you get down to 300 weapons, come talk to us. But the question is, could you go to the Chinese and say, look, uh, you know, you seem to be comfortable with the level that you have now. We're not going to ask you to reduce now. But if you took on a political commitment not to increase, you're going to help make the conditions better for the United States and Russia to bring their forces down. And then we can worry a little bit later on about how we talk about the nuclear reductions, but at least get that first step there. I, I don't think that's going to be easy, but there may be an opportunity for Washington and Moscow to work together and, and try to do this. And, and part of this is in... In 2015, you have the review conference for the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. 190 countries will be there. You know, can Washington and Moscow maybe work together to persuade other countries to sort of gently hinder the Chinese and the British and the French? And I think the British will be okay on this. I, the Chinese and the French are going to be reluctant. But that they have to begin to do something, maybe along lines of, you know, a no-increase commitment. Hmm. Well, let's just throw in all the other complications and variables into the pot. Yeah. So if 
let's say India and Pakistan, uh, China, Israel, uh, all sort of agree to get yeah. into the game. Yeah. You know, when I asked my, my, my dad, who uh, listened to, to uh, one of your talks and looked at the book that I was reading, I said, Dad, what's it all about? And he said, uh, you know, he wants us to get back in the game. I said, yeah, that's about right. So let's say we get everybody into the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's pick a number, right? 300, 400. Yep. So the United States and Russia are in a deep reductions mode. Uh, the other nuclear powers are kind of inching their way up. We meet around 300 or 400. Mm -hmm. Is that a good is that a good stable strategic yeah. balance for the world if uh, you know yeah, these mm -hmm. countries all kind of have the same? It's different yeah, yeah. than when you know there was a preponderance where the U.S. Mm -hmm. and Russia had you know the lion's share, and then there was the rest, and then there was nobody. Yeah. So is yeah. that what does that world yeah. look like? Well, th this will not seem fair to anybody who's not an American or Russian. <laughs> But, but, I, but I'm not sure that there are advantages in sort of having nine or ten nuclear powers all at the same level of, say, 400 weapons. Um, I, I think that brings in some risks. So, and I, I think also, certainly for Moscow and probably also for Washington, I, I don't think either of those countries say the way the reductions process works is we all come down to 300 then we all go down together. So I think there would be an expectation, which I would regard as a legitimate both in Washington and in Moscow, that if the United States and Russia get to those numbers, then China, Britain, and France are already reducing so that you have the U.S. and Russia still with a bit more than the other countries. Um, and, but again, that, that's a problem I think is probably four or five steps down the road in, in, in a number of years. Uh, but, but it's hard for me to see either the Russians or the Americans saying, okay, let's all go down to that 300 level roughly where Britain, France, and China are, and then we go from there. I think that's not going to work out. And again, I. I think in terms of strategic stability, there may be certain advantages to having two nuclear superpowers as mm -hmm. opposed to have nine states that are all at the same level. Yeah. Uh, North Korea with 300 weapons would not uh, leave me very comfortable. <laughs> no. Uh, back again to a, a definitional issue that, that comes up, and that is the, the purpose of the reserve. Is that a hedge yeah. so that we can reload yeah. or, or, or rearm yeah. yeah. or... Now, what is the purpose of having a reserve? Sure. And and what is when you talk about a reserve? Are those actual warheads or broken systems? Or can you flesh yeah. it out a little bit? What that is? Because yeah. no. those are the ones that you're you're talking yeah. about is maybe starting to trade include. Yeah. 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 No, I I think I think the U.S. military uh, they like the large reserve for a hedge for two reasons. One is geopolitical. It's a hedge against surprise. You know, what if they wake up? I mean, there are some people who argue that China has 5,000 nuclear weapons because they have a series of caves. I actually think they have a lot of caves because that allows them to move the relatively small number of weapons around the caves so we don't know where they are so we can't target them, which is a very understandable policy for the Chinese. But the, um, it, so part of it is geopolitical surprise. If there's a surprise, we can build our capability back up. The other is also a hedge against technical surprise. You know, what if we were to wake up tomorrow and discover that the W-76 warhead had some kind of a design flaw, and at, you know, on May 31st of 2013, all the weapons stopped working. <laughs> they have weapons, that, warheads that they can swap in for it. Uh, so, I mean, the, the military on the American side will you know, not give these things up easily. Uh, part of the thing is, I think, to basically... Uh, improve the ability of the national labs so that you can say, look, if there's a problem in the weapon, we can detect it more quickly and we could respond more quickly. Uh, but again, it seems to me that that's a more, uh, it's a larger cushion than we really need. And I think there are advantages in trying to trade away part of that to get the Russians to get rid of their tactical weapons, which concern not only some in the Senate, but also concern to U.S. allies. Well, again, uh, on, on Russia, and there are uh, several questions along the same line, but it kind of goes back to the Ronald Reagan quote that, you know, <laughs> trust, sure, <Yeah. laughs> trust, but verify. I mean, can you trust Russia? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, what is the, what, yeah. what, what is the level of risk uh, yeah. If, yeah, sure. if something goes wrong or if the Russians – Go off in a, in, in a different direction than you know than than headed towards a more amicable or peaceful world, and that becomes uh, 
perhaps even uh, more difficult when the numbers go down. So yeah. is the, does the verification yeah. challenge sure. get yeah. harder or easier as the yeah. numbers go down? Okay. Well, the starting point would be the New START Treaty, and the intelligence community is very confident that they could detect a militarily significant violation in time to react before it would undermine U.S. security. So, you know, if the Russians sneak in 1,551 warheads, we might not detect that. But if they were to do something that would be significant, you know, they're very confident they could detect that with plenty of warning time to respond. Um, now, I think the question of verification, um, you're going to be, want to be more certain of your verification measures as you push the numbers down. Mm. Uh, so when you start talking about going into storage places and counting weapons, I, I actually think if you, if you have a requirement that all weapons are at storage deep places, you can have a system to count those fairly easily. The question then comes, well, what happens if some side keeps the weapons outside of a declared storage area? And at least today, it may not be a problem. If the Russians squirrel away 200 weapons in the Ural Mountains that they don't declare, uh, you know, that's bad for arms control and it's bad politically, but it doesn't change the strategic balance. And, and, and what you hope to do is that the verification process, it, it's a learning process, and so that as you begin to do this and as the sides become more comfortable, then you begin to look at other verification, more intrusive verification measures, because you're going to have to have more intrusive verification measures as the numbers go down. Because again, it, it, if the Russians can hide 200 weapons when each side has 4,500, it's not a big deal. If the Russians can hide 200 weapons when we're down to 250 each, then it's a very big deal. But again, I think there's time and, and there's a lot of technology. And there are actually some things being worked on now, I think, in, in some of the labs that could be uh, applied. Uh, again, requiring that the militaries on both sides go a little bit beyond their current comfort zone in terms of, you know, you want us to show the Russians what? <laughs> yeah. And you're going to have to be able to do some of that if we want to see some things on their side. Right, right. Well, we're running out of time, but I do uh, think that uh, it's worth throwing in the, uh, the, the proliferation side yeah. uh, of the equation at least a little bit. And you know, the, 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 the premise uh, that, that you laid out for us is that if we were to make some great strides in arms control and the U.S. and Russia were able to move in this direction and engage the other nuclear powers, that that would give you some, some mm -hmm. currency yeah. and more, more credibility with which to form coalitions uh, to pressure uh, North Korea and Iran and the countries that, that uh, are, are not abiding by the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty or the, the mm -hmm. norms of, of, of non-proliferation. So the question from the floor is, uh, is, is rather blunt. Why don't we take them out? <laughs> but, but, yeah. but it's, but it's a yeah. valid question because, you know, at yeah. some point if, if North Korea is building up and really threatening the United States mm -hmm. of America with the delivering yeah. nuclear yeah. warheads on long-range missiles to our territory, uh, and, and Iran continues along the, the line that it is, uh, appears to be on and, and is able to make similar threats to, to, to Europe and, yep. and beyond. Uh, you know, what are we left with? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's several arguments against uh, taking them out, so to speak. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, only, nuclear weapons have only been used in conflict twice. And in, in, the, in the years since then, I think there's actually been a pretty – hefty norm built up against the idea of using nuclear weapons. So certainly, I think, an American nuclear strike on North Korea or Iran in a preventive or preemptive way would be usually dangerous. It would lower that norm. Uh, and it would basically send a message to a lot of other countries in the world that you need to have nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I also think that applies in the case of a conventional strike. I mean, um, Iran, at this point, the assessment of the U.S. intelligence community is Iran has not yet made a decision to have a nuclear weapon, but they want to have in place the pieces, enrichment capability for uranium, uh, a design for a warhead, and a missile capability, that if they did make the political decision that they could put a nuclear weapon together within a matter of months or a couple of years. And, and this is actually kind of referred to some as the Japan option. Japan has a policy of not being nuclear. But if you, Japan has plutonium reprocessing, Japan has the technology to do a warhead, Japan has rockets. If, if Japan made that political decision, they could be a nuclear power fairly quickly. Uh, I think we want to do everything that we can to encourage the Iranians not to go beyond that point. Uh, and that's where I think uh, as scary as an Iran with nuclear weapons is, and I think it's, it's very scary because from a proliferation aspect, some of my colleagues at Brookings believe that the day after Iran demonstrates it has a nuclear weapon, 
uh, Pakistan ships several nuclear weapons to Saudi Arabia. Right. What do the Egyptians do? What do the Turks do? And, and you think about what the Middle East would look like in six or seven years with five nuclear weapon states. Th that's a pretty scary picture. Uh, so it's, it's scary, that idea. But on the other hand, I look at the possibility of an Ameri you know, some, some advocate a military strike using conventional weapons. And I think that has a lot of risks. Risk number one is if Iran hasn't made the decision to get nuclear weapons, the day after either the Israel or the United States bombs them, they will make that decision. And then lots of other things will happen. Uh, one, right now we actually have a very good picture of what the uranium enrichment capability is, assuming that they haven't scrolled away a secret site somewhere. But I think a lot of people are spending a lot of time and money looking for that. Because Iran still is a member of the International Atomic Energy Agency, and it has all of its activities under IAE supervision. So we know exactly how much uranium they've reached to 3.5 percent and how much to 20 percent. Uh, the first time an American bomb falls, those IAE inspections get shut down. And so we lose our insight in their program. Uh, I also go back to uh, Secretary of uh, Defense Bob Gates a few years ago was asked about it. And he said, American airstrikes would not end the program. It would simply delay it. So I think we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to go back and bomb Iran every two or three years? Uh, and again, assume that would have enough insight to sort of gauge where their program was. And then you have to ask questions like, the Iranians are not going to sit back and take an American. They, they might not be, I, I think the Iranians could probably not defend themselves well against American Air Force capabilities and, and, and naval air, which are you know, very, very good. You know, but they would find ways to get back at us. You know, what trouble do they make in Afghanistan? What do they do in Iran? Do they unleash terrorism against the United States? Do they s try to close the Straits of Hormuz? The U.S. Navy could keep the Straits of Hormuz empty, uh, open, but if Iran is able to knock out a super tanker every three or four weeks, what does it do to the price of oil? And are we, you know, ready to pay eight dollars a gallon for for gas here if it if it really d drives it up? So I think there are a lot of downsides to that. And, and therefore, you go back to this negotiation, which is being conducted by the permanent uh, five of the UN Security Council in Germany, Iran. It hasn't succeeded yet, but there's still a chance. And, and, and hopefully, you can create for the Iranians the idea that there are some pretty stiff sanctions. I mean, Iranian exports last year fell by 50 percent, uh, primarily due to countries deciding they were not going to purchase Iranian oil and gas. And that's causing hardship. The, the value of the Iranian rial has fallen about 80 percent of the last year. But also to offer them some carrots and say, if you're prepared to do the right thing in terms of keeping your nuclear program peaceful and civil, you know, we can move towards maybe a more normal relationship with Iran. And, and then you, know, you want to have that difference as big as possible so you crystallize a choice in their minds. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I think it's going to be a, a hard process, and uh, I, I'm not sure how certain we can be of success on it. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we, we may have time for just one more if, okay. if, yeah. if you're, if you're sure. game. So, uh, so our final question uh, is about uh, other forms of WMD, weapons of mass destruction that may not be uh, the classic nuclear weapon. Uh, so the question is, is uh, whether you take uh, seriously the risk of uh, uh, elect electromagnetic Pulse, you know, mm -hmm. the Commission on yeah. Electromagnetic Pulse uh, concluded that this was a real problem. And, and then there are other, uh, you know, biological, yeah. chemical, cyber, mm -hmm. other things yeah. out there. Is, yeah. there. is there something else that we ought to be paying attention to? Well, that covers the gamut. I mean, and, but I, I think there, in each case, uh, start with electromagnetic pulse. I mean, first of all, um, and this is basically uh, a nuclear, we the concern of nuclear weapon detonated in space would generate a pulse of electromagnetic energy, which could fry the digital circuits that we depend on and perhaps shut down the grid for, electric grid for five or ten years. Uh, first, I, I, I think there's a lot of debate about, in fact, if that threat is as big as some portray it. Uh, there was a, one case where the United States uh, did a nuclear test in space, and it had some impact on Hawaii. Uh, but when you read the accounts of what really happened, the impact was much less than, you know, some people now say this was that it shut down all the electronics in Hawaii for a week. Uh, the second thing, though, you have to ask is if somebody, and I think the idea here is, you know, some adversary of the United States calculates, well, if, if we don't put a nuclear weapon into the United States, but we detonate it, 70 miles in space, and it shuts down their electronics, and it basically puts us back to 30 years. You know, that kind of thing, how's the United States going to respond? Yeah. And, and the, the bet they have to make is, well, we didn't drop a nuclear weapon on your territory, so you're not <laughs> going to do one on ours. 
You know, but if in fact, if it did that amount of catastrophic economic damage and such, I'm not sure that that adversary could be confident that the response would not be nuclear. It crosses the line. It crosses the line. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, and again, that's where I get back to this. Nuclear weapons have only been used in conflict twice. And, and, and nobody's made a distinction. I, I don't think we're prepared to say, oh, there's a cutout for electromagnetic pulse weapons. I, I, I think that that's a, and it's in our interest in making that bar and that norm as strong as possible. On chem, I mean, on chemical and biological weapons, one of the things that the Obama administration did in 2010 in its nuclear posture review, which I think was a good step, it basically reduced the circumstances under which it would use nuclear weapons. And it, and it said, actually, we want to get to a point uh, that the administration said where the only reason for nuclear weapons is to deter a nuclear attack on the United States or on American allies. And so we're not there yet. But what they adjusted was what's called the um, negative security assurances. And it's a public statement against whom the United States would not use nuclear weapons. And what they said was the United States would never use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state that is a member of the non-proliferation treaty and is in full compliance with its obligations. And they said, even if that state attacked America or American forces with chemical or biological weapons. And the calculation there was if, if somebody were to hit an American force with chemical weapons, yeah. that would be damaging, but uh, American conventional capabilities are sufficiently strong that it could exact you know, a fairly high retaliatory punishment. You would not have to go nuclear. And the bio case, I think the assumption at this point is nobody would really use a serious bioweapon simply because the way the world is linked, there's no way that you could guarantee that it wouldn't come back to your own population. Now, uh, uh, the, one, the one cutout we put in the asterisk in, in the book that we wrote about this was we, we support when we think the Obama policy is right with the provision that if, if somebody ever came up with a superbug, and definite, a, a superbug, and then said, we now have this superbug, and we've inoculated our whole population, you know, at that point, you might want to say, okay, in that case, maybe we would go back and make an exception for bio-use. But I think that that's still quite a ways in the future. And I think it's, I think it's a smart approach on the Obama administration to try to reduce and make more explicit the circumstances under which the U.S. would resort to nuclear weapons. And, and that's consistent with the idea of trying to reduce the role that nuclear weapons play in our overall security policy. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Pfeiffer. That concludes our program for this evening. So on behalf of the World Affairs Council, I'd like to ask you uh, to join me in thanking Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer for his excellent talk.